Hi folks, uh, my name is Dr. Kashif Perzada at the University of Toronto Physician Assistant Program and I'm going to go over toxicologic emergencies with you. Now the talk will be broken down into a few areas. We're going to go over general principles, um, the different toxidromes, and selected overdoses which all of which you should be aware of intimately. Now your general approach to the poisoned patient um, you know, as with any emergency patient, you need to evaluate the ABCs. Um, decontamination, very important. Um, well, let's get back to the ABCs for a second. Generally, um, in massive overdoses, there's going to be some derangement of the vital signs. And this will give you valuable information on what toxidrome is involved. Is the patient bradycardic? Are they tachycardic? Uh, are they hypotensive? Are they hypertensive? Are they hyperthermic or hypothermic? Very important. Decontamination. Uh, this involves washing the patient um, using activated charcoal, whole bowel uh, irrigation. You know, how do we eliminate the toxin? Are there antidotes? Also, you should know the principle of supportive care. Uh, this means, you know, improving someone's blood pressure if it's low, bringing down their blood pressure if it's high, giving them IV fluids, ACLS protocol for the arrhythmias that might arise, and your so-called universal antidotes, uh, summarized by this a mnemonic uh, TONG, thymine, oxygen, naloxone, glucose. Now decontamination, generally, you know, if you're covered in toxin, then uncover yourself. Wash it off, remove the affected clothing, uh, wash your eyes. Um, this is from a one of those mass casualty exercises which happen periodically, maybe at a hospital near you. Um, you know, wash your eyes, remove affected clothing. Now internal decontamination could take the forms of um, a gastric decontamination, so activated charcoal. So this is useful within the first hour of ingestion, but useless for things like lithium, alcohols, and hydrocarbons. Whole bowel irrigation, um, useful for drugs that are not absorbed by charcoal, such as iron, lithium, um, enteric coated meds, um, you know, um, which can form concretions in the stomach, like aspirin. And body packers, your typical patients who are trying to sneak through customs with condoms full of cocaine, um, through customs, so you might see those eventually, uh, occasionally. Uh, there's also multi-dose activated charcoal. This is basically giving activated charcoal, um, uh, you know, on a regular basis, like Q6 hours or something like that. And this is useful for long-acting medications like OxyContin, very large ingestions, life-threatening toxins, and your cathartic agents like sorbitol or lactulose. Now, the usefulness of that is that the activated charcoal only binds binds to medications and drugs, but it, it is also reversible. So you want to get the charcoal out of the bowel as soon as possible. That's what the cathartics are for. There's also another agent um, called intralipid, which you don't really need to know a lot about, but um, this is useful for cardiotoxic local anesthetic overdoses like lidocaine or marcaine and um, maybe even tricyclic overdoses. This is available in specialized centers. It's a fat emulsion. Those of you who've used propofol uh, might be familiar with it, but propofol is not a useful replacement for this because it also lowers blood pressure and uh, etc. Now we're going to go over some selected toxidromes, uh, the major ones, cholinergic, anticholinergic, sympathomimetic, opioid, sedative, hypnotic, and serotonergic. Now your opioid, sedative, hypnotic, um, you know, responsible for the deaths of some of our favorite actors and actresses, sadly. Um, this includes the opioids like morphine, heroin, oxycodone, and benzodiazepines. Um, this can cause CNS depression, uh, meiosis, respiratory depression, hypothermia, bradycardia. Uh, you treat the, if you suspect an opioid um, toxidrome, uh, then you can treat with naloxone and uh, ventilate if necessary with your ventilator. Anticholinergics, uh, the drugs you might run into um, out there are typical antipsychotics, antihistamine, tricyclic antidepressants, antispasmodics, and plant alkaloids, as well as atropine. Now, think, uh, try to picture in your head, and maybe this Mad Hatter here, um, the uh, toxidrome involves people being flushed, so red as a beet, hyperthermic, so hot as a hair, um, dry as a bone, mad as a hatter, so confusion. Um, tachycardia, dry mouth, red and flushed face, dilated pupils. The treatment is fluids, benzodiazepines, cooling if necessary, 
uh, supportive management, IV fluids, etc. And in very severe cases, physostigmine. Now your sympathomimetics, uh, these are your, your cocaine addicts, your amphetamine users. You know, you'll find these, peop uh, these patients after raves or you find them off the streets, often brought in by your EMS in ag agitation. Um, you'll notice these patients have dilated pupils, they're agitated, they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive, hyperthermic, and diaphoretic, they're sweating, um, and this can lead to seizures, MI, rhabdo, and cardiac arrest. So imagine, you know, the scene in Pulp Fiction with Uma Thurman on cocaine, or more accurately, uh, a movie star who has disturbingly dilated pupils who's sweating. Um, this is, uh, these are all, you know, um, part of the sympathomimetic toxidrome. How do you treat this? Benzodiazepines, often high dose, um, IV hydration, and external cooling if this is, if the hyperthermia is severe. Now, serotonergic, uh, this is um, more common now because of the, com uh, the common uh, prescription of uh, SSRI antidepressants. And this can often happen when these, a combination of these meds are taken, SSRIs, TCAs, and uh, MAOIs. Um, this can lead to altered mental status, increased muscle tone, hyperthermia, hyperreflexia, rigidity, and tremors. And this you also treat with benzodiazepines, supportive care, and cooling. How do we tell the serotonergic apart from sympathomimetic? Generally, in my experience, the serotonergic toxidromes have the increased muscle tone and rigidity that you won't really notice with uh, sympathomimetic. These patients are generally very confused and these patients are generally very agitated. There is a difference. Uh, cholinergic toxidrome, um, you'll see in farm settings where people will be exposed to organophosphate pesticides. And then this patient, uh, just you can remember with the acronym DUMBLES, they are basically secreting from every possible orifice. They're vomiting, they're crapping, they're sweating, um, they're, uh, you know, they're, they have secretions coming from the respiratory tract. Um, they're basically um, trying losing fluid from every possible source. Um, you can treat this with atropine, often massive quantities of atropine, um, and 2-PAM and other supportive measures. Now, our first case is something that has been seen very frequently now in Ontario. Um, this has been the subject of recent legislative changes. And actually, the province has even gone as far to restrict the use of oxycontin and oxycodone because of the epidemic of overdoses in our province. So, a patient has been brought to you um, into the eMERGE with a heart rate of 45, a blood pressure of 100 over 60, respirate of 6 to 10, temperatures 34 degrees, and the saturations are 95%. Your patient appears sleepy, drowsy, and is difficult to rouse. The ambulance crew believes that there may have been empty pill bottles. I'll break, you know what, I'll tell you ahead of time, it's Tylenol 3s. Pill bottles strewn in the patient's room. This may have happened about half an hour ago. His airway is patent so far, but he has no gag reflex, I should mention. He has a decreased respiratory rate at around 6 to 10, but he has a strong carotid and peripheral pulses, and he has a normal BP, though bradycardic. His GCS is 12, but his pupils are pinpoint bilaterally and reactive. What are some clues we can glean from this? So, he has a heart rate of 45, he's bradycardic. His pressure, normal, but a little bit on the low side, respiratory depression, hypothermia. He's sleepy, drowsy, difficult to rouse. This is your sedative hypnotic uh, toxidrome. And like a good student that you are, you give the patient IV, naloxone, and flumazenil because you read in your book that that is the antidote for drugs that could cause this toxidrome, which are um, you know, opioids or benzodiazepines. And then you notice that your patient develops a tonic-clonic seizure, and you try to give IV lorazepam, which is also in your book as a treatment for this, and it doesn't work. What was the mistake here? All I can say is you should never, ever, ever, ever give flumazenil a non-differentiated overdose. 
you don't know if this patient is addicted to benzodiazepines and you could trigger acute withdrawal. And acute withdrawal could take the form of seizures. And what is the treatment for seizures? Benzodiazepines. But you've just ensured that no benzodiazepine will work for the entire half-life of the flumazenil. So don't ever do this. And also, a secondary point is that if you give a full bolus dose, let's say 1 milligram or 2 milligrams of naloxone in an opioid-addicted patient, you could also trigger acute withdrawal and cause seizures. But if you were smart enough and did not give the flumazenil, then you could actually treat with, uh, with IV benzos. The second issue is there might be a possibility that our patient took 80 tablets of Tylenol-3 with codeine. Each tablet contains 300 milligrams of Tylenol, 15 milligrams of caffeine, and 30 milligrams of codeine. Now let's uh, leave aside the opioid and caffeine toxicity issues. And let's go over what um, the uh, Tylenol toxicity. Now, luckily for you and your patient, there is an antidote for Tylenol overdose. The maximum dose is 4 grams per day. This, and the toxic dose is 8 grams. So this patient took about 24 grams. Now what you do is you need to obtain a Tylenol level at 4 hours and follow the results afterwards. And th at the 4 hour level will tell you, and this is 4 hours post ingestion, will tell you if the patient is, has a toxic um, overdose or not. And then you can start the antidote. Um, which here in Ontario is called mucomist, but the uh, generic name is N-acetylcysteine. This drug is useful if it's given in the first 24 hours, but even more useful if given within the first 8 hours. And you can ensure that this patient, by the early start of this medication, you can ensure that this patient will not have a necrotic and dead liver uh, a few days from now. Now, briefly, I'm going to go over tricyclic antidepressants. Prior to the SSRI, psychiatrists, in their imminent wisdom, prescribed a medication for depression, which, when taken in, in excess, was very effective in actually killing the patient. The wisdom behind this, I'm not quite certain. This was before my time. Um, the TCAs can cause a sodium channel blockade, resulting in cardiotoxicity um, and, and death. Primarily, anticholinergic effects are present. Mild to moderate overdoses, you have confusion, altered mental status, slurred speech, dry mucous membranes, urinary retention, decreased bowel sounds, etc. All the things in your uh, anticholinergic toxidrome. Now, with severe overdoses, you have ECG abnormalities, conduction delays, supraventricular tachycardia, increasing PVCs, VTAC, hypotension, coma, seizures, respiratory depression all bad things. Um, how do you see this on ECG? You'll notice a right axis deviation of the terminal 40 milliseconds of the QRS complex, sinus tachycardia, prolonged PR interval, widened QRS, and prolonged QT. Treatment, if you see a widened QRS, is sodium bicarb. Um, magnesium sulfate if you have torsades, but generally at this point the patient is pulseless and resting, so you should also be doing CPR. Um, here is torsade de points for a neat reminder. See the undulating, oscillating pattern of the V-fib um, V-fib here. Um, standard supportive measures, benzos for seizures, ventilation, IV fluids, and pressors if the patient is hypotensive. This is your terminal ECG findings that I was mentioning, um, that you'll see in a TCA overdose. You can find this on, uh, Wikipedia. Now we're going to go over, you know, your Saturday night special. Someone who's been drinking a bit too much, um, you know, found down somewhere, maybe at a bus shelter, maybe at the local bar. Um, your case, basically, the patient rolls in and you find the patient has a, a vital signs as listed here. Um, he appears difficult to rouse. He's drowsy. He's filthy. After all, his face was in that urinal. He smells of alcohol. You also note a fruity odor on his breath. The paramedics did notice he had one episode of bright red hematemesis en route. The airway is patent. He has decreased respirate at around 6 to 10. 
He has strong pulses and as you can see, a normal heart rate and normal pressure. His GCS again is 12 and his pupils are reactive bilaterally and, um, and equal. Now, what are some clues we can draw from this? Um, his vital signs look good, but he's difficult to rouse. He smells of alcohol, um, but he also has this fruity odor and an episode of hematemesis. So you get your vital signs, and you notice that he has largely normal electrolytes, something called an osmolar gap, which is 60, an ethanol level, or alcohol level, which is zero and your toxic alcohol levels are pending. Now, some questions for you. Um, how do these labs point towards isopropanol toxicity? Now, create an algorithm which will help you identify and treat um, a toxic alcohol um, overdose. And what are indications for dialysis? So let's go over these. So, ethanol itself, alcohol, uh, common variety, um, most used and abused intoxicant in North America responsible for quite a few deaths um, and this is often the result of respiratory depression and mostly accidents from cognitive impairment. The clinical features you should all know slurred speech, disinhibited behavior, CNS depression, altered coordination. Um, look out for other injuries, head or c-spine injuries, often masked. Um, one of the specific exclusionary factors on the nexus criteria for clearing a c-spine is altered level of consciousness made with alcohol in mind. And always consider other medical conditions. Um, is this patient having a diabetic emergency? Is this patient having a stroke? Is there, are there other intoxicants at play? Don't assume that the patient coming into that, uh, in your emergency room is an alcoholic. Always do full history, if possible, a full physical exam. Treatment, um, usually observation until sober, careful physical exam might be a good idea to do an osmolar gap, um, do your blood sugars, uh, CT head if, appropriate, if necessary, and give your IV thiamine or multivitamins. Now we're going to go over toxic alcohols relevant to the case we just mentioned. Um, these are isopropanol, methanol, and ethylene glycol. Osmolar gap is your best friend in these cases. This is how you calculate it. Uh, two times the sodium plus the BUN level plus the glucose. These are all in the SI units. Um, the Americans have a separate conversion, you know, involving divisions, etc. Um, the normal osmolar gap should be 10. So when you're in your um, emergency room, you need to order a osmolality of the patient, and then you'll need to calculate um, the serum osmolality, then you'll need to calculate the, uh, S the osmolality based on these values, and the gap will give you the osmolar gap. Also calculate the anion gap. Uh, in this case, um, normal, in all cases, sorry, is normal is less than 12. So uh, isopropanol, uh, it's rubbing alcohol involved in hair care products. Uh, it's metabolized into acetone and acetic acid. Its effects are similar to alcohol except they're longer lasting and more profound. Often you'll hear the phrase twice as uh, sedating and twice as um, in duration. In, uh, in terms of uh, sedating effects. The patient will also have a, fruiting, a fruity odor, hemorrhagic gastritis, the blood bleeding that we saw, early onset coma, and decreased respirations. In this case, uh, the key point is that there is a high osmolar gap, but if you calculate back to the, uh, if you look at the electrolytes, there's no anion gap. So even though you don't have your, um, your toxic alcohol levels, often these are send out tests in various hospitals, you can surmise that this patient has an isopropanol toxicity. And you activated charcoal is useless. Um, you can give IV fluids, blood products if blood loss is severe, um, dialysis if there's severe hypotension or, or if there's massive ingestion, um, and then you just monitor them, basically. Now, the more deadly toxic alcohols, ethylene glycol and methanol, um, these patients usually present with both an elevated osmolar gap and anion gap. Methanol and ethylene glycol are metabolized by an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Al methanol becomes formaldehyde, formic acid, ethylene, ethylene glycol becomes formic acid, oxalic acid, and, and glyosilic acid. Alcohol dehydrogenase, um, your best friend if you're out for a night drinking. 
basically converts your alcohol into an aldehyde with some NADH and hydrogen uh, protons. Um, this is the uh, protein structure of liver alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, clinical features of uh, methylol, methanol toxicity. Um, these are visual disturbances, like patients will complain if you've screwed up and not given the antidote, or if they've come late, um, that they're looking at a snowstorm. There's abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, lethargy, coma, retinal edema, it can be seen on fundoscopy. Ethylene glycol, there's three phases. In the initial 12-hour um, phase, initial you'll have altered mental status but no smell of alcohol. The next 12 hours, the patient will have tachycardia, tachypnea, elevated blood pressure, um, you know, CHF symptoms, respiratory distress, and hypotension. And um, beyond the first day, you'll have acute tubular necrosis with renal failure, elevated CK, hypocalcemia, and prolonged QT interval. So basically, renal failure. So how do we uh, treat this? Basically, you need to keep your toxic alcohol from becoming the toxic metabolite. You need to basically compete for the attentions of this enzyme by giving it something else to pay its attention to. So you would give, in the old days we used to give alcohol, like plain old ethanol, actually bonded to alcohol dehydrogenase better than the toxic alcohols. And in the meantime, the patient will excrete, or you can dialyze um, the toxic alcohol. Um, oops. So you can do that. Another agent that's been developed is called fomipazole, um, which um, you don't doesn't involve intoxicating the patient with ethanol, and uh, this can be given as one dose, maybe repeated, if necessary. Um, you also can give vitamin cofactor treatment. Uh, folate and pyridoxine, depending on which toxic alcohol you suspect, and that helps convert um, uh, to non-toxic metabolites. Um, you should give calcium replacement therapy because of the hypocalcemia, and you should dialyze if there is an anion gap metabolic acidosis and, if, and or evidence of end organ damage, such as visual changes or renal failure. So that about wraps up uh, this lecture.